Okay, this is a companion lecture. It's going to be about punishment under Jim Crow, and by that I actually mean the system of racial oppression that existed in both the North and the South in the early 20th century, late 19th century. One thing is, I already did this talk when I was doing the other lecture, but once again, this is basically based on four studies that I was able to turn up, one about New York, one about Philadelphia, and two about Georgia. So sweeping generalizations may not be accurate. A critical part of what was going on was this intense racial idea about criminality that was playing out. Um, as one author put it, black female offenders were perceived through a racial lens as evidence of the primitive qualities of the race. Bad women were seen as dark, large, hairy, aggressive, in a word, masculine. And this was applied to ethnic women, women of different ethnic groups such as Italian, Jewish, other groups, but it was also intensely applied to black women in particular. And what it does is, in essence, is that it contrasts the weak, frail, helpless white woman to the muscular, powerful, dangerous black woman is the contrast. In the case of Georgia, where the focus is definitely on race rather than ethnicity, you start having all kinds of representations in the newspapers of things like negresses, crazy negresses, leather-skinned negresses, and jet-black negresses, women who were supposed to have done horrible acts such as luring white girls into prostitution or whipping brutally blue-eyed white babies. And this also fit into the concept of criminality as something that was inborn and inherited, and therefore it was seen as something that was part of what it meant to be black, was this tendency towards criminality. How does this play into the way that black women who are accused of crimes were treated? Lynching primarily attacked black men, but black women were also victims of lynching. For crimes of murder, accused, accusations of murder, accusations of assault of a white person, accusations of theft of white property, arson, verbal threats to white people, resisting rape, and testifying against white terrorists, all of these things could be perceived as crimes which could lead to a lynching of a black woman. One of the things that intensified the interaction between African American people and the criminal justice system in these years was the growth of police surveillance as police became much more used in cities and particularly targeted African-American communities. And so it's a, it's a complicated situation where most black people were opposed to lawbreaking, seeing it as something that confirmed white stereotypes and also seeing it as a violation of the community. On the other hand, they were very skeptical that the police were there to help them, particularly because they knew that the police tended to ignore certain kinds of crimes as long as they took place in black neighborhoods, not white neighborhoods. So prostitution, gambling, illegal lotteries, a whole series of crimes were allowed to take place in black neighborhoods that were illegal in white ones. And so you have this police surveillance that results in many cases in police intervention in black people's lives. So for example, if two black women got into a fight, 
instead of it being an issue that one of those black women would go to the, then go to the police for help, instead what often would happen is the police would intervene and then arrest both of them. Fines. One of the issues that resulted in disproportionate treatment of black women was the issue of poverty. So for a lot of street offenses, things like fighting or drunkenness or misbehavior in public, the, the punishment for those would be fines. The problem is, however, even among relatively poor whites and black people, black people were poorer usually than the white people. And so whereas white women might be able to pay those fines with some help from their family and friends, it would be very difficult for black women in many cases to pay those fines. If they could not pay the fines, they were then imprisoned for a period of time in jail or some other place. So that financial situation of poverty turned one form of regulation, fines, actually into another of incarceration. Black women were arrested more often than white women. They had difficulties because they couldn't pay their fines. In many cases, in addition to that, when judges saw black women in court, they were much less likely to assign black women probation or rehabilitative services than they were likely to assign white women who were seen as more salvageable. In Philadelphia, 6% of the population was black, but almost 20% of those awaiting trial and 20% of the penitentiary population was black. So you get the, the huge disjuncture that was playing out even in that time period. Black women were 40% of the female inmates and that's despite only being 6% of the population in general. In the case of Georgia, what we're looking at when we look at women in prisons and um, incarceration, we're looking overwhelmingly at young girls and young women. 69% of women with felony convictions whose ages were recorded were 25 years of age and younger and 18% of those serving times for felonies in 19th century Georgia were black girls under the age of 17. And what was happening was that when black girls were getting arrested, they were getting arrested as adults under adult laws for property crimes. In Atlanta, they were 19 times more likely to be arrested than their white female counterparts and were prosecuted as adults for a range of municipal crimes. So once again, we see this, this reality of young black girls being treated as adults by the criminal justice system. Chain gangs. In the South, there was the use of labor, prison labor, as workers for various people who leased gangs of workers from the prison system. In those gangs in Georgia, which is the one where I have information about, women were the minority in convict leasing camps, but they were present in almost all convict leasing camps. So you'd be looking at just a few women in there. What they did could vary. In some cases, they were expected to do the same hard labor as the men. Um, no you know, special treatment for them being women. Often they were expected to do the cooking for the prisoners, do the laundry and mending, which meant waking up at 1 or 2 a.m. and preparing buckets of foods for 50 to 150 prisoners. Rape was a common problem, something that a lot of women faced, and a lot of women who became pregnant were forced to work just like they had, just like a man, even through their pregnancy. The camps were filled with disease, pneumonia, malaria, tuberculosis, flu, and prisoners were whipped for punishment. 
just like they had been in slavery. And in some cases, women would be stripped for the whipping. Once again, just the similar thing that we saw happening in slavery. By contrast, most white women were granted clemency because they were too frail for hard labor, was the belief. So we're looking at a system in which there were racial expectations that African Americans were much more likely to be criminals, and particularly black women were overwhelmingly more likely to be seen as criminals than white women. We're looking at a system in which there's an increasing amount of police surveillance, which leads to intervention in black lives and often increases the amount of women who end up in the criminal justice system. And finally, we look at a system of punishment that treats black women much harsher than white women and also runs the danger of, of leaving black women isolated in a situation where they're surrounded by men, many of which may be violent or abusive towards them. And then once again, here are the sources that this comes from. 